There were two youngsters walking home from Sunday school. Each were deep in his own thoughts. Finally, one said, What do you think about all this devil business we studied today? The other replied thoughtfully, Well, you know how Santa Claus turned out. He's probably just dad too. <laughs> all right. Open your Bible <laughs> and we'll take a look here. All right, let's go to uh, uh, John's Gospel for just a moment. And uh, please notice, if you will, John chapter 6, a couple of verses that I think are absolutely wonderful, not only to lead others to Christ, but also for your own assurance. Okay. By the way, welcome to those that are watching on the internet today. And uh, I think I'm sinking. They're trying to get me centered up here. Okay. Well, welcome, all of you internet folks. You don't care whether I'm centered or not, but they do out there on the internet. All right. John chapter 6, what a wonderful passage. It says here in verse 47 as plain as you'll ever see it stated in the scripture John 6 47 verily verily or truthfully truthfully I say unto you he that believeth on me hath or has everlasting life can't get any simpler than that if you are paying attention Christ said don't miss what I'm saying here Verily, verily means truthfully, truthfully. That means a truth that you don't want to miss. All the verily, verily verses are very important. And he says, I say unto you, please notice here, this is Jesus who is the God-man, and this is God speaking when he speaks. And he says here, I say unto you. You see that throughout John's Gospel when Christ is quoted. He doesn't quote others. He says, I say say unto you. This is what God says, the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here, he that believeth, that word means to trust. He that trusteth on me hath, or it should read in modern English, has. Has everlasting life. If you believe on Christ, according to this verse, present tense, right now, you possess everlasting life. And that means what? It'll still be everlasting life tomorrow next week, a year from now, ten years from now, a hundred years from now, and obviously that means that you're going to go to heaven whenever you die. You have everlasting life and your soul will live on into eternity and can never be lost once you become saved. It's amazing how many churches believe you could lose it. And if you believe you could lose it, you're really saying that you have to work to get it or keep it and that means a false plan of salvation. And we're not saved by works. I had a church that wanted to rent some of our facilities here. And I said, show me your doctrinal statement. Well, they sent it over. And it was interesting. You didn't have to read very far. But it says, the security of the believer is conditional. And then, oh boy, they listed all the things that you had to maintain or do to maintain. That was the end of that. I said, sorry. <laughs> the believer's security is conditional. It's not conditional. It's unconditional. It's based upon what God has done on our behalf. In any case, you'll find most churches, the majority of them, most denominations believe you can lose it. And what does that mean? It tells you right up front, you don't really want to go there. And their message is really flawed from the get-go because they believe that you can lose it. Every Roman Catholic believes they can lose it. That's what Roman Catholicism is all about. The Greek church and so many denominations. I could m mention all the smaller ones, but there's hundreds of them. And they believe they can lose it. I was raised in a church just like that. I'll never forget when I got saved, I uh, thought that it would be something well applauded in my church if I told them about it. So I went back, finally when I began to open my mouth about my salvation, I shared in church that I knew I was going to heaven. And uh, I found out 
that that didn't go over well. I found out that all of a sudden I was in the midst of a controversy. I found it wasn't long that I was whisked into the presence of the pastor. And he said, what's going on? And I said, I've been telling people that I know I have eternal life. I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. And he says, well, you can't know that. And I said, well, I do. And he said, well, you can't know that. And I said, well, I do. <laughs> I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew a couple of verses like this one. And 1 John 5, 13, that says, absolutely. If you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have, H-A-V-E, or in this verse here, he that believes on me has everlasting life. I have it. And I have it because the Bible says so. I didn't realize what controversy would break out over that, but it sure did, because it was clear they were saying what I had thought they had said all my younger years, that you had to work your way to heaven, that you had to wait till after you died. When the scale was brought out and the works were read out of the big book, and they applied weights representing good works and bad works on the scale. And you watched the scale fearfully, hoping it would tip in your favor that you had done more good works than bad works and it would let you into heaven. Well, what a wonderful thing it was to discover what the Bible had to say. And we can be fully assured. Verse 37 says, Him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. You'll never be lost. Verse 39, even better, he says, that he would not lose one person who has ever trusted Christ as their Savior. Turn, if you will, now to Hebrews chapter 10 for just a moment. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. And I'm still heading there, so I'll give you the page number when I arrive in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, you'll notice it says here in verse... 10, by God's will, by the which will, we are sanctified, that means made pure and holy, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. What is interesting is that the Bible says it's a done deal, it's once for all, Christ paid for all sin, it's settled. But then notice verse 11, talking about religion, what a verse that you ought to become familiar with, where it says, and every priest, Hebrews 10, 11, page 1300, every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can what? Never, never, never take away sins. Isn't that amazing? What a contrast. Here we have Christ who made one sacrifice that paid for all sins for all men forever. That same doctrinal statement that I referenced a moment ago said that Christ did not pay for your future sins. <laughs> I said, that's amazing that they would so boldly say that. All of our sins were future when Christ died, and Christ paid for every sin that you and I would ever commit in our whole lifetime, and he's died to pay for those that will be born next week and next year, and a hundred years from now, or hundreds of years from now. You know, we have, the world is going to be around at least a thousand more years. Christ will come for us at the rapture, then there will be seven years of tribulation, and then Christ will return physically to rule on this earth for a thousand years, and there will be people born, be being born all throughout that entire thousand years. They will all need to know Christ as their Savior to be saved. And uh, we find that Christ has already paid for their sins. Notice it says here in verse 14, By one offering he hath perfected for how long? Forever. Them that are sanctified. Now, I want you to go down to verse 17 where he says, Their sins and iniquities, God says, will I remember no more. Their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more. They're gone, 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 gone. Uh, the Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, back in Psalm 112. They're gone. And uh, never to be remembered, it says in verse 18. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more or no additional offering needed for sin. Christ, one payment, did it forever. Now, I said all that to get you to verse 22, where it says here, let us draw near with a true heart, and look at the words, full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. It occurs twice in the book of Hebrews, and I'll never forget, as a young believer, 
I read a book by Harry Ironsides called Full Assurance, published by Moody Press. And wow, what a great book that was for me because I was being battled by the church I was raised in to say you couldn't be fully assured, that you could lose your salvation. And here I was wrestling with the passages that they would throw at me. What a wonderful book that was. Full assurance. And I saw these phrases for the first time that I could be fully assured. And I love that hymn as well. It's a favorite of mine. We close out our Sunday evening service every week with that. Blessed assurance. This is my story. This is my song. You know, Jesus Christ paid our sin debt in full so that we could be fully assured. You can be fully assured that you're going to heaven whenever you die. How good that is to know. So you can be confident, the Bible says. You can know that you are saved. Now we're going to go over to 1 John and we're going to review just a little bit and then we're going to move forward in the study we've been doing here on overcomers and overcoming. In chapter 5 of 1 John, page 1325, we have several verses that talk about being an overcomer. And I remember bypassing all the verses that dealt with overcomers as a young believer because I thought they were speaking to someone else, not me. I thought, boy, those are only written to super Christians is what I had imagined. But look, if you will, at verse 4 of chapter 5. For whatsoever is born of God, here's the word we're looking for, overcometh the world. And we just learned in chapter 5, verse 1, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Then verse 4 says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even what? Our faith. So we learn here that believers are overcomers, that if you have trusted or believed that Jesus is the Son of God, you have been born again. And if you're born again, then you have overcome the world by virtue of what Christ did for you on your behalf at the cross. Look at verse 5 now. Even better, who is he that overcometh the world? Answer, he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Question and answer, it's right there. Who is he that overcometh the world? Answer, I'm an overcomer. Why? Because of what Christ did on my behalf. I have believed that Jesus is the Son of God. I have trusted Him as my Savior. And as a result, the Bible says, I'm an overcomer. Who is he that overcometh the world? Answer, he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's the way it is used throughout the Bible. And every believer can say, that's me, that's me. I am an overcomer. Not because of anything that you have done, but because of what Christ did on your behalf. And when you trusted Him, you became an overcomer. And look, if you will, at chapter 4, verse 1. This is a great verse. Beloved, believe not every spirit. It's saying here, don't be gullible. Wow, are people today listening to too many of the wrong sources? And they oftentimes will buy in to something that is, is not true. And it's amazing they will do this because they think, well, this person is... Is, is a minister of God and he's telling the truth and uh, don't realize that that minister really might be Satan's minister. You know, it says over in Corinthians, I'm not going to turn there, but it says Satan is an angel of light. And it says we shouldn't be shocked to find that out. He appears to be one who brings light or truth and he appears to be nice. He's not as we see him on the potted meat cans in the grocery store. He is not there with a red suit and uh, a tail with a barb and a pitchfork and horns out of the side of his head or the corners of his head. Uh, Satan is a beautiful creature. It was his beauty that caused him to fall. And Satan is a minister or an angel of light. Then it says, therefore, it is no great thing that his ministers, his pastors, his Bible teachers should be ministers of light as well, that they would be ministers of righteousness. In other words, what they would do is they would tell you to do righteous things to be saved rather than the true message that the righteousness of God is required and is given 
based upon what Christ did on your behalf. We become overcomers. We become seen by God as righteous because of what Christ did for us on the cross that he paid our sin debt in full. So it says here in verse 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of what? God. Because many false, the modern word would be preachers, are gone out into the world. And behind them are Satan's demons, which are spirits. And it says, don't believe. Test what they are saying, because false doctrine ultimately has been uh, initiated by the devil himself. But here's the verse I wanted you to get to in verse 4. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. And there, again, we see the word overcome used. And the them here is the spirits, the false prophets, uh, the false teachers, uh, Satan in his whole realm. And it says, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because you have worked hard and been baptized and joined the church and you're giving money and you're praying. No, none of those things. It is not dependent upon what we have done, but upon what he has done for us. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them, the demons and spirits, because what? Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Christ dwells in us. And because we have believed that Christ is the Son of God, he comes to indwell in our bodies. And because Christ is greater than the devil, we, as a result, have overcome the devil. And therefore, we have overcome them, the spirits, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Isn't that great to know? Doesn't that pump you up? Doesn't that make you feel a little bit courageous? Doesn't that make you feel like you can go out and tell somebody about the gospel? Because you are an overcomer. You have overcome Satan and his gang, the demons. And it's not because of anything that you have done. It's because of what God has done for you in Christ at the cross. It says here, you are of God, little children, verse 4, 1 John 4, and have overcome them, the demons, the spirits, the false teachers, and so on, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. We all ought to be able to stand up and speak out and be strong with the gospel of Jesus Christ because we have full assurance, as we read there in Hebrews 10.22. We need to come having full assurance. You ought to be able to say, I know, I have eternal life. And we found that this morning, if you were in the early celebration of the Vacation Bible School, we had kids raising their hand, responding to questions, and saying they knew the answers, and they knew they were going to heaven, and they had eternal life, and so on, all based upon the fact that they would the Bible had to say. A little girl up front said, I know a lot about God. Arr. I said, most adults would be fearful of taking you on uh, because she was confident in her faith as a little girl, knowing these things come from God's Word. So we're all overcomers if you're a believer here this morning. And as a result, there are wonderful promises to the overcomer. We've covered some of them in the book of Revelation. But I think I'll jump all the way to the end of Revelation to look at one, and then we'll back up and fill in the blanks here. But turn, if you will, to chapter 21 of the book of Revelation. And by the way, I don't want to distract you by telling you this, but I went ahead and typed them all up for you. These are most, most of the overcoming verses in the Bible all right there for you. So you might find that a nice little study sheet uh, to go back and review with. The chapter 21, verse 7 says, He that overcometh, and who is an overcomer? 1 John 5, 5, I'm going to quote it. Who is he that overcometh the world? He that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So here we have it. Put that in the margin if you have to. But it says in verse 7 of Revelation 21, He that overcometh shall what? Inherit all things. Wow. <laughs> What a statement. Have you ever learned of an inheritance that you may have or are going to receive? That probably gets your ear perked up. But look at what this says. Woo, man, I have really hit the jackpot. As a believer, I am an overcomer. And it says, he that overcometh shall inherit what? All things. I'm rich. <laughs> 
I have a home in heaven. I have a home where the streets are made out of pure gold. Wow. I will inherit all things. And then notice, our salvation is directly related to this thing of believing on Christ. It says here, God says, I will be his God and he shall be my what? Son. Isn't that what we're seeing consistently with this whole doctrine? Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. 1 John 5, 1. Verse 4. 1 John 5, 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Then verse 5 says, Who is he that overcometh the world? The one who believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So you'll notice it's all interrelated. When you believe on Christ, you become born again. So he says here, I'm going to be your God and you're going to be my son. You become born again and you become a son of God or a child of God from the moment you believe. And it says here, as a result, you wind up inheriting all things. Now, I'm going to go to one that's a little more uh, level of difficulty. It's chapter 12 of Revelation. And you have to think. But the answer is always the same. You know, you always interpret a difficult verse in the light of a clear one. So if you have a verse that you don't quite get, never, never come up with an interpretation that contradicts a clear verse. You always stick with the clear verse. Stick with the verily, verily. Stick with John 6.47 that we began with today. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me has everlasting life. If you find that you find a verse that you think contradicts that, whatever you think that verse means, you're wrong. You're wrong. The Bible is written by one God. And the Bible is consistent with itself. And it's never going to contradict. So if your interpretation seems to imply we have a contradiction, your interpretation is wrong. And when you look at it carefully, you'll find that's always the case. Always the case. And uh, here is a verse like that. Here we have an incredible battle described. This has not happened yet. This will happen in the middle of the tribulation period. It says here in verse 7, there was war in heaven. That's talking about the atmosphere around the earth. Wow, talk about Star Wars. I mean, this is really in this category. I think a lot of science fiction just kind of steals away the great stories of the Bible and tries to uh, fantasize about them. But this is the real thing. Three and a half years after the rapture, it says here in verse 7 of chapter 12 of Revelation, there was war in the atmosphere around the earth. Michael and his angels fought. Now Michael is the archangel of God, and under his charge are all the angels that are called the just angels, or the saved angels, or the angels that stayed with God when Satan led his rebellion. And notice, who did they fight against? It says they fought against the dragon. The dragon? Why do we believe in dragons now? Well, look at verse 9. The great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called what? The devil and Satan. So Satan is the dragon, and he's described as a dragon. And we find here that there's a battle that's going to take place in the atmosphere over the earth. The dragon fought and his angels. And notice verse 8. We learn real quickly who wins. The devil did not win. He prevailed not. Neither was there found any more, uh, found any more, uh, found place, neither, neither was their place found any more in heaven. That's in the atmosphere on the earth. Satan is right now the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.8. He controls the earth. He controls the atmosphere around the earth. And the tribulation period is really an unfolding of how the way will be prepared for Christ to come back and take away this world from Satan. And so, just like in any military operation, if you watch what happens in war as of since the airplane, what do we do first? We take out the enemy's air control, take out their radar, take out their airplanes, we strike their planes if we can on the ground and wipe them out before they can never get off the into the air. And as soon as war breaks out, we put our planes up in the air so they can't be struck on the ground, don't we? We want to maintain, if we can, air superiority. That happened in the first uh, war in Iraq, wasn't it? We came in and 
took out everything, and we were absolutely in control of the airspace over Iraq. Then our military could come in and mop up. And uh, that's what Jesus will do. He sends Michael out to take over the airspace around the planet. Satan's in control of it. So Michael fought against Satan, and Satan fought, and he prevailed not. So he loses control of the airspace around the earth. I really believe why the rapture happens the way it does, where Christ comes into the atmosphere, the Bible says, and shouts, and we're caught up to meet him in the air. I believe that's because we are traveling through Satan's airspace at that point, three and a half years before this event. And if Christ didn't give a safe escort through Satan's airspace, we'd probably have difficulty going up. Satan and his angels would be hitting us all, each on the head as we came up. Boop, 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 boop. Just knocking us Christians back down to the earth. I believe the fact that Jesus comes into Satan's airspace and gives us a safe passage, that's why we're able to get through that airspace and meet the Lord in the air. I really believe there's a spiritual battle out there that you and I cannot see with our physical eyes. And uh, the demons, Satan's angels, would love to prevent this from ever happening. And so the rapture uh, only happens because Christ comes into Satan's territory. And we find here that, verse 9, the great dragon was cast out. And uh, he was cast out, according to verse 9, into the earth. And his angels were cast out with him. So he loses control over the airspace. Now, it tells us here about believers that Satan is the accuser of in verse 10. And in verse 11, it says, These believers, they overcame Satan by what? The blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Now, it says here they overcame him, notice, by the blood of the Lamb. That's again what happens when you get saved. We are what? washed in the blood. We sang two hymns about the blood today. Did you pay attention? There are a lot of churches that are not singing about the blood anymore. It seems to be offensive to many churches because they're moving away from the blood and from the cross. They don't even deal with the cross even with salvation anymore. They just present a Jesus that's standing there and saying to you that he's knocking on your heart's door and you just open your door, and he comes on in, and you're saved. They don't talk about the death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. They don't talk about his shedding any blood and making a payment for your sin. They just say that Jesus wants to come into your heart. That's totally unscriptural to begin with. There is no reference that says to invite Christ into your heart or to your life to be saved. We simply trust Christ. And so there are dozens of things that preachers recite that God never said. Did you know that? There are preachers saying things that God never said all the time. Hold your place here. I just got to show you this with you. It's too exciting. Jeremiah 23. We'll come back. Don't lose Revelation. But Jeremiah 23. Here God talks about preachers. And this is about right now. It was spoken thousands of years ago, but it's talking about now. How do I know that? Well, I'll, I'll share that with you right now. I want you to notice verse 20 of chapter 23, page 796 in your Schofield Bible. It says in verse 20, The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he hath performed the thoughts of his heart. Look at the next phrase here. In the what days? Are you marking it in your Bible? In the latter days. Verse 20. Chapter 23 of Jeremiah. In the latter days, ye shall consider it perfectly. We're considering it right now. Isn't that amazing? Here we are. In the latter days. How do we know we're in the latter days? The latter days are defined in the Bible as when the Jewish people, after a 2,000 year dispersion, would go back to their land. We're living in the latter days right now. And it says, in these latter days, we would consider this perfectly. 
we can see what God has said here in Jeremiah probably uh, 2,600 years ago, a reality today. It talks about preachers saying things that God never said at all. It says here, notice in verse 25, I have heard what the preachers, the Old Testament word here is prophet, I've heard what the preachers say that prophesy or preach lies in my name, saying I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the preachers that prophesy lies? Yea, they are preachers of the deceit of their own heart. He says, as you go further down here, he says uh, in verse uh, 31, I am against the preachers, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. And what he's saying here is, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But they're saying that I said it, and I didn't say it. And so God says, that, that kind of makes me mad. Doesn't that make you angry when somebody says that you said something you never said? I mean, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. And that makes you angry. Well, God gets angry when people say things that God said and he never said them. And that's what it's saying here. And so the Bible here talks about that exactly. Well, we know that uh, we are saved when we are washed in the blood. And the blood is, of course something that is not being preached on or sung about as much anymore, unfortunately. But uh, we believe that it's important to talk about the blood of Christ. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and then it says here, by the word of their testimony. We've talked about this before, but the word of their testimony is referring to the testimony that Christ, or God gave concerning Christ, that you and I have believed, that then becomes our testimony. The testimony of the believer is not you standing up and talking about some Christian life experience or how God has worked in your life or how God has raised you up from an illness or got you through a financial difficulty or another problem. It is you're telling us that you have believed the message that God gave concerning His Son of the death, the burial, and the resurrection that you have embraced and believed and it has now become your testimony. So this is how they overcame the devil. By saying, I have, as Jesus said in John 6, 47, believed on him. And therefore I have everlasting life. And he promised me he'd never cast me out. And he would never lose me. So therefore I can constantly have full assurance because he said so. And so here, this is all talking about in the, the first phrase and the second phrase that we're saved by Christ, the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony that we have come believing on Christ as our Savior to be saved. If you come in any other name or come in any other way, you cannot enter heaven. Christ said, I am the way, the truth, the life. And he said, no man can come unto the Father but by me. So when you approach God, unless you're coming in the name of Jesus or Yeshua, He's not going to let you in. That's what it's about in Matthew 7. They said, Lord, Lord, why we preached in your name and healed in your name, did wonderful works in your name? They said, you can't come uh, boasting about what you've done. You have to come in my name. So He says to that crowd, I never knew you. I never knew you. The Bible says, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. That is Yeshua. Or in English, it's Jesus. And that means happy is the one that comes to the Father in the name of Jesus because the door is open and you go right in. But if you try to go to heaven through your church denomination or through your baptism or whatever you're trying to get in with, you'll never make heaven at all. You're not going to get there. Now, let's go over to earlier in chapter uh, 3 of Revelation. And we've already covered a couple of these. So we'll look at one that we haven't seen as of yet. It says in verse 12 of Revelation chapter 3, page 1334, Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out, and I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God, and I'll write upon him my new name. 
Again, the overcomer is the believer. And he's saying here, I'll make him a pillar in the temple of my God. What is a pillar? A pillar is a substantial uh, part of the, of, the, of the building, isn't it? If you pull the pillars down, the, the building will fall down. And uh, we all are going to be made pillars in God's uh, temple in heaven. Isn't that exciting to know? Hold your finger there. Look at Galatians. You know, when Paul got saved, uh, he got saved after the other apostles. And when he went to the other apostles and shared what he knew, they couldn't contribute anything to what he knew because he had been personally taught by Christ and what he had received was by revelation from Jesus himself. And if you go to your left to page 1242 in Galatians chapter uh, 2, you'll notice here that uh, Peter here goes to Jerusalem and he comes to the other disciples and it says here in verse 9, when James, Cephas, Cephas is Peter, by the way. Galatians chapter 2 verse 9, when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be what? Pillars, notice, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me, notice, uh, and Barnabas, the right hands of fellowship. They said, we're, we're on the same page. We believe the same thing. And he, these men, uh, and it names three here, James, Peter, and John, were pillars in the early church. And what did that mean? They, they were strong for the faith. They stood up for the faith. They were looked to as leaders in the faith. And uh, they were, therefore, pillars. And uh, very, very, very essential members of uh, the early church. And the Bible says here in Revelation, because you are an overcomer, that you also, in heaven, are going to be seen by God as very important, very important to the building, to the structure, that you are going to be a pillar. And that tells me that we'll all be pillars, even as James and Peter and John were pillars, we'll all be pillars in heaven. Not because of anything we've done, but because of the grace of God. And when they perceived the grace that had been given to Paul, they included him. They said, come on. They gave him the right hand of fellowship and included them. And so we're going to really be uh, elevated right to a very high position as uh, believers in heaven. And if that weren't enough, let's go over now to verse 21. To him that overcometh, and again that's the believer, will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Jesus Christ is the God-man. He's God. And he will one day sit upon his throne, ruling over the universe. And notice what it says here. I will grant permission to you that are overcomers, that are believers, to sit with me in my throne, even as I also ever, I also ever overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne. Isn't that amazing? Though Christ, who overcame on our behalf, was exalted in heaven upon a throne, and so when we get to heaven, we will be allowed by Christ to come, and I just envision climbing up in His lap and sitting in His throne with Him. Can you imagine how exciting that would be? You know, as a, as a little boy, maybe you have done this as a parent. You get your little child and put him in your lap and you kind of teach him to drive in a, hopefully a big open park and line a safe place. And, and they're just so excited to be sitting uh, in that place of control where you're teaching them how to drive the lawnmower or the, or the car or whatever it is. And, of course, that's nothing compared to, can you imagine, sitting on the throne where the whole universe is run. <laughs> I mean, there is no more important place. I've gotten a chance to visit down here at uh, McDill where they ran the Gulf War and where all the team members are that uh, sit there, and that's the war room. That's where they run the war. And uh, I, uh, it was uh, just amazing. And they had 
several, uh, an admiral and uh, some, you know, big top generals in there that gave a little talk while we were there. But I thought, wow, I'm here in the very room where all this power is controlled. The armies are told what to do and they're running the war from this room and I'm standing in this room and I'm here where it's all happening. But I had to say, wow, that's so pale in comparison when you think that one day you're going to get it sit in the throne with Jesus who controls the whole universe, the most powerful man, the most powerful being who has ever existed and will etern eternally exist as he is the God man as he's God. It's incredible, isn't it? So we're going to get to sit in this throne. That's going to be an exciting moment where all of us as believers are going to get to enjoy that. So what it's saying here is overcomer, as overcomers, we really inherit what? All things. Remember that verse? We started with it. And we get to enjoy all things in heaven. We had an incredible future ahead of us. And it's not based upon the fact that you're better than I am or I'm better than you are. I mean, we're all sinners saved by grace. But it's because of God's wonderful grace that He has uh, overcome on our behalf and we therefore become overcomers as He is. And we have all these wonderful promises that are given to us that tell us about what is ahead for us in our future. A Christian who has a bad day, when you think about this, really, it can't be that bad, can it? Because, wow, look at what's still ahead of us. When you die, when you're all of a sudden absent from the body, present with the Lord, wow, you wouldn't ever want to look back. You wouldn't want to turn back to what you left here on the planet Earth because it's not worthy of being compared, as it says over in the book of Romans. If you could catch a glimpse of that, you don't even want to complain, you don't even want to moan or groan, you don't want to uh, look back, you want to just look forward to what God has for you ahead, and it's really going to be great. I think we're living close to Christ's return, and who knows, really, I mean, you, you see the news and, and you have to say, wow, you know, Abinajab of Iran is promising that he's going to destroy Israel very soon. Promising he's going to bring the war against us in the West. A madman, really, who wants to use nuclear force against us. There's so many things happening. And the potential is there. If they could have the nuclear bomb now, put it on a ship, float it into one of our harbors, detonate it without it ever coming off the ship. And the Tampa Tribune last year had a full page about that, and it showed the destruction for 25 to 30 miles from the point of, of that bomb going off. Can you imagine if a ship floated right into Tampa Harbor? That's what they had in the paper. They showed it right downtown Tampa, floating in and then being detonated, and how that you could just just count all life for 30 miles in every direction, gone. Wow. I mean, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? 9-11 would be pale in comparison, and they would love to have that kind of impact. And, you know, what are you going to do? We just know that we're leaving at the rapture. That's what I know. And you can't do anything about that. I mean, we really have to just trust God and you maximize the time that we have while we're here to, to do as much as we can reach out as far as we can and try to make sure everybody's safe. We've had several deaths and several serious uh, accidents and, and medical problems with people here lately in our own church. It's something that we need to realize that it could be any one of us. And we really need to make sure that our families are saved. I know that uh, there's a person within just a few feet of me is telling me, we're, my wife and I, we're, we're making a list. Uh, not a Christmas shopping list. They're looking, making a list of people in their family that need to be saved. And we're going to go after them. We're going after the family. And I think, really, Christians have to, you have to do that. Be aggressive. Start asking yourself, who still is not saved in your family? And what are you doing to reach them? Because you don't want to wait till after the rapture's happened to do that. You need to do it now. And maybe even make plans to leave behind a message should you be raptured out, that they would find. A lot of people 
like to put with their special papers a written testimony or an audio tape or a videotape. I did a funeral a couple of years ago that they had, now they have, you know, video. And, and here was the man who had died telling how he trusted Christ. And he said in his testimony, don't worry about me. I'm in a far better place. But I'm worried about you, that you may not join me unless you trust Christ as your Savior as well. I said, boy, this guy, you know, had a plan, didn't he? He knew he was dying. He was getting older. And he sat out back on the swing and had his daughter videotape that. And they played it at the funeral. I said, I've never seen anything more powerful than to see the deceased up on the screen telling those that were at his funeral how they needed to know Jesus as their Savior. I said, wow, what a great idea. I want to pass that word along. You might think of doing that. Just sit down with that video camera. Tell your testimony. Should you ever die, have someone know about it so that they would see that it gets played for all those who come. Wouldn't you want to say that word to those that are left behind if you passed away? Wouldn't you want to share that with them? And I'll tell you, there's nothing more powerful than you saying it. There's no preacher that can have the impact you could have. That if you would share it, it would really powerfully, powerfully impact those that are left behind. Think about it. What can we do? Well, I think we ought to be creative and figure out ways that we can get this message out. And there are lots of ways that we can do that. So plan ahead. And uh, funerals can be an opportunity to win the living to Christ. And I think we ought to plan on doing that. Let's go ahead and, and, and bow in a word of prayer. With heads bowed and with eyes closed. My friend, there's only one Savior. There's only one way to enter heaven. And that's Jesus Christ. And if you're here, or you're watching on the internet, wherever you might be watching from, and you're not sure about where you would spend eternity, you need to really think seriously about this and put your trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because He is the only entrance to heaven, the only way to be saved. He is the only Savior. And right now, you could whisper a prayer between you and the living God. And you could say, God, I'm a sinner. I don't understand a whole lot about the Bible, perhaps. But I believe Jesus died for me. I believe He shed His blood and paid my sin debt in full. I believe He was buried. I believe He rose again from the dead. I trust Jesus Christ right now to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of eternal life. The moment you do, pray that prayer. God saves you. And you have his word, which he's never going to change, to go back and review. That he says that you have eternal life at the moment you believe. If you're looking for a feeling, don't. We're never told to look for a feeling. If you look for a feeling, you probably will be very up and down in your assurance. Our full assurance that the Bible talked about in Hebrews today comes from the testimony of God concerning Christ. That by one offering, He perfects you forever. Your sins and iniquities, He will not remember anymore. That there's no additional sacrifice ever needed. You're saved forever. And that you can come near to the Lord in your daily walk, knowing and having full assurance that you're saved and saved forever. And that although the devil might want to rob that from you, it's really something he can't take away. But... If you're not in the Bible, perhaps you would doubt or not be fully assured as you ought to be. And it requires going into the Bible and being reminded as, what God, as to what God has said. God can't lie. He's not going to trick you. He's not going to deceive you. If God said it and you believe it, that settles it. And you can be absolutely assured of going to heaven from the moment you trust Christ into eternity future. If you haven't prayed that prayer yet, do it right now. God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I trust Jesus right now as my Savior, as the one who paid for my sins at the cross by His death and shed blood and was buried and rose again from the dead. I trust Him right now to save me, to forgive me, to become my Savior. The moment you do, God up in heaven does. If you just now did that, I'm going to close in prayer. We're going to do it in such a way that you'll not be embarrassed. I do this on purpose. No one's looking. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. I'm going to pray. No one will see. 
uh, except for me, and so no one will know. Therefore, you will not be put on the spot, will not have anybody looking that will come grabbing you by the arm or pointing you out or in any way singling you out. But while heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I'm going to ask in a moment, if you prayed that prayer to trust Christ as Savior today, if you wouldn't mind just letting me know, I'm going to ask you to lift your hand and put it back down, and then I'm going to close in prayer, and I'd like to include you. Are there any that would say, I did that right here today. I trusted Christ. God bless you, man. Anyone else? I trusted Christ as my Savior. Slip up your hand and put it down. Anyone else? Raising your hand doesn't save you, but trusting Christ does. And when you trust Him, He saves you. We had four adults in Sunday school that raised their hand earlier at the children's program. How wonderful. Anyone else want to be included here? I trusted Christ as my Savior right here today. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this one by the hand that indicated she trusted you as her Savior. Give her assurance. Let her know it's really so. Help us all to realize that these overcoming verses are wonderful verses of promise to every one of us that are believers, not based upon our accomplishments, but based upon what you did on our behalf at the cross as you substituted yourself into our place and it took the punishment we deserved and overcame Satan and death and the grave uh, on our behalf so that we can inherit all things and that we might become your sons and you would become our God and our Father as a result. Give us a great remainder of our summer. Help us, Lord, to really be able to prepare ourselves, each one of us, to know the Bible well enough to share it with somebody else, to use the tools, the tracts, and the other means that we have at our disposal to open that conversation and share it with someone that's lost. Help us to get a vision for reaching our family, the closest members and the ones that are the furthest, uh, the ones that live in other towns or are more distant in their relationship to us and as a family member and win them all to Christ as we can. And we ask your blessing now in Jesus' name. Amen.